welcome to Compassion Watch, the television outreach of the Prince George's Compassion Project. Addressing domestic violence and animal cruelty at the root cause. I'm Tim Saffel. And I'm Linda Saffel. Thanks for tuning in. Well, Linda, this is our premiere episode, and it was quite a uh, tough decision to come up with what we should do on this first program. There are a lot of choices because there's so much going on. That's right. We're uh, accepting registrations now for our Holistic Healthcare for Pets Summer Courses 2009 that will be held in June. And don't forget, it's kitten season, and a lot of people out there are concerned about homeless cats in their neighborhood. That's right. Then there's our advocacy work with Prince George's County on behalf of animal lovers. It seems like there are a lot of very different issues, and it might be hard for people to see how they're related. That's just it. Well, how about we just give our viewers an overview of how many of the various things that we do and show them how they do relate to a common issue. Okay, I think it's important, first of all, to uh, give people an idea about uh, how our organization got started uh, to begin with. And uh, it happened about 10 years ago when about four people got together who were concerned about the treatment of hom homeless cats. And uh, when we tried to do some research, we realized that there really wasn't any other uh, resource in the area for information or training about what to do with uh, these uh, homeless animals. We contacted a number of organizations to uh, ask them what would fit with their program. That's right, and it, uh, we didn't find a match anywhere. Uh, so, in fact, we started a nonprofit organization uh, on our own, the Prince George's Feral Friends, um, using the uh, trap, neuter, return approach. Um, Trap, neuter, return, though, uh, although we were, uh, we did quite a few uh, colonies um, when we first started, we realized that there were some issues that were not being addressed in the, uh, in the community. The uh, neighbors were kind of feeling like they were getting left out. Well, that's right, because all we were doing was taking care of the cats, and we weren't taking care of the neighborhood. Um, uh, the, the neighbors didn't know what was going on. Some of them didn't understand what the program was all about. Um, sometimes I think they wondered what were these strangers doing in their neighborhood. Well, sometimes they may have thought that we were actually taking them to be killed, uh, but they didn't also understand the benefits of the Trap, Neuter, Return program and having a managed colony in the, colony in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So um, we realized pretty early on that we had to expand – from just doing the trap, neuter, return part to a full-blown program, which included uh, training uh, in the issues and uh, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood issues, as well as trapping skills. And um, I think uh, we wanted it more to be something that the neighborhood actually felt like they owned. That's right, where they were par actually participating in it, and therefore, of course, they knew what was going on and they could support it because it was their project. And, of course, a project approach means that they wanted to be able to tell how far they had to go, and uh, we needed to keep records and track the progress of the project towards completion. That's right. And um, we realized fairly early that there was uh, a, a bigger issue than just the treatment of these homeless cats uh, to be concerned about, and uh, we learned that there was a relationship between this disregard for homeless cats and the value of their lives and also the uh, seeming disregard for uh, our fellow man, our human uh, lives, which results in different f forms of violence like domestic violence and uh, child abuse and elder abuse and, and so forth. And also, just on a very simple level, we were leaving out the considerations of the people who are caring about the cats. So we wanted That's to make sure right. that uh, the people in the neighborhood were happy about the cats. That's right. They needed our support as well. By the way, about the, uh, the link between um, domestic violence and animal cruelty, we do have a guest lined up for, the, for a future episode. Uh, we will be having Ken Shapiro, the executive director of uh, the Animals and Society Institute, on a future program. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Um, but as far as this, uh, this link is concerned, the link is a term that was coined by the American Humane Association. And uh, since then, the Humane, Humane Society of the United States has started a program called First Strike that's based on the link. Uh, 
where they try to anticipate uh, some form of violence in order to, or rather they, they try to detect one, some form of violence in order to anticipate the possibility of other forms of violence. And um, we can see cases of this, like in the, um, the, uh, some of the violent crimes like the uh, Columbine shooting and everybody knows about going postal where people would go into the workplace and, and uh, do something violent. Um, that in many cases, the history of this person reveals that there was animal cruelty uh, in, in his past. And there seem to be a lot more instances of that than are reported in the media. That's right. I'm sure there are. Uh, the other, the other uh, case is also true, though, that uh, it's not only that animal cruelty develops into domestic violence or, or workplace violence, but um, a, an abuser in a relationship, uh, if the target of the abuse leaves that relationship, Sometimes the abuser will take it out on the family pet. So it can, can go from a domestic violence to animal cruelty or the other way around. But in terms of turning it around, I think it's also true that uh, caring for a family pet is a good thing and develops um, responsibility and, and uh, positive uh, attitudes. That's been shown that, uh, that a child who grows up with a pet or, or responsibility for a sibling uh, it is less likely to develop in um, uh, to de develop to engage in violent behavior uh, later on in life. Um, now we, we feel as though as an organization that it's our not only our right but our duty to um, advocate for uh, policies and changes that would promote compassion in order to deal with the uh, violence in our communities. Now we've, because we've seen a trend in uh, the number of animals that are handled by our animal control in Prince George's County r raising, and we've also, un we also understand that uh, Prince George's County has the second highest crime rate in the state of Maryland after Baltimore City. And we think that there's a connection. So we feel that there could be some changes that could be made in the county and its policies in order to correct this situation. I think we also saw in the uh, project that you did with Pet Smart Charities support in 2004 that you know people were a little puzzled about why they should invest money when when they finished with their project the cats could be killed. Well, that's right. It, it, it's it's seemed as though. Uh, we had compassionate people working for the good of the animals, and they were being um, uh, discouraged by the county policy, which was to come afterwards and just kill the animals without any regard at all. Uh, so changing policies and attitudes is definitely something that uh, our nonprofit organization is interested in doing. And uh, of course, like I said, we as a nonprofit organization have the right to to do um, uh, grassroots ad advocacy as well as advocate with the county for changes in policies that uh, are are beneficial to our concern. You know, we have an upcoming guest on uh, on our program, uh, Lee Mason with uh, OMB Watch, is going to be talking about free speech issues as, That's we, right. as they relate to uh, nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. He's the director of nonprofit free speech. In fact, we mm -hmm. we uh, we're looking forward to him coming on. Um, but it, in the past, we've been dealing with the county in uh, doing advocacy 